I think the best way to start is could you uh, introduce yourself and talk a little about yourself? Yeah, um, I want to say a pleasant good afternoon to everyone that is present on this particular Zoom. Uh, my name is Idrissa Dumbuya, an advocate for refugee and people seeking asylum in Australia. Idrissa came to Australia 2018 from Sierra Leone, having gone through persecution. I've been a teacher and a journalist back home. And since arriving in Australia, with the passion and the struggle that I see people seeking asylum going through in Australia, I continue with my passion to advocate for people seeking asylum because majority of them, English is not their first language. Mm. And that helps me to navigate as to how my activism has got me far and wide so that most of their aims and objective can be actualized through networking. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about the experience of transitioning from a high school teacher in Sierra Leone to a refugee advocate here in Australia? Yeah, um, it, is so, it is something that is quite a bit um, difficult because initially the language barrier, mm. like first arrived in Australia, it was very difficult for me to understand and either try to comprehend when people speak and try to interpret it. Mm. And that was like a very huge barrier for me. And also um, the cultural differences. Yeah. The, they are the cultures that we had in Africa or from the part where I came from to that of Australia. It's quite, diffi it's quite difficult. It takes me like a couple bits of time for me to be able to adjust to the system here. Yeah. And being a school teacher back home, coming to Australia, I just felt like um, it would be like um, an easy ride for me to like continue my teaching career whilst living in Australia. But it was very difficult because like in Australia, um, they never recognized my degree from overseas. Oh, wow. And the pedagogy, like the method of teachings that we use in Africa is quite different from the one that they use um, in Australia. So um, it's quite so like a bit change my, my passion yeah. and switch to my second career, which um, is journalism. And that was like a situation that I feel like for me to be actively engaged in talking to people, changing their narratives about asylum seekers and refugee, mm. advocacy will be the best platform for me to be able to actualize that particular dream. So it is something like, actually, if I think about it, there are times, there are, there are a bit of frustration because you think about something that you have been doing for eight years back home, mm -hmm. coming here, you just feel like, this is what I want to deliver to people. And automatically it's changed naturally because this is not my country of birth and the systems that have been involved in Australia is quite a bit different, mm -hmm. which is quite understandable. Yeah. Yeah, so it is something that is very difficult. But for now, I think I'm happy to what I'm doing. Are there any specific difficulties that you can talk about? Yeah, um, one has to do with um, housing. Mm. Because um, coming here as a refugee, especially as a asylum seeker, you live on bridging visa. There are a lot of facilities, probably permanent residents or citizens have access to. And as a, as, a, as a asylum seeker, there are barriers that you cannot be able to like have access to. So housing is quite a bit difficult. It took me a very long time for me to be able to adjust to find um, a temporary accommodation. Instead, I was like living in a crowded accommodation wherein most people that I used to live with were of different background, different culture, hmm. and I could not be able to integrate with those people or neither for them to be able to understand the cultural differences that exist. Mm. And secondly, in terms of resources and finance, like um, majority of us are living um, as a low income earner. And most of the income that we had from well-wishers, refugee organizations, it is not even enough to be able to look after yourself fully. So these are some of the challenges that actually I've been mm. going through and others <clears throat> and other asylum seekers through are going through that. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think that after going through those difficulties, it makes it difficulties, it makes it a lot easier for you in your advocacy work because you've gone through that personal experience? Um, I think with all those difficulties, it gives me the right footings. Hmm. By that, I mean, with all those challenges, I felt like if I'm going through that, what about those who could not be able to even speak the English language? Yeah. 
So that gives me the right footings at least to stand yeah. as an intermediary or a link to those asylum seekers that could not be able to speak English language fluently to mm. advocate for them so that most of their basic amenities like food, shelter, clothing and housing could be able to have access to. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Hmm. Uh, could uh, uh, what um, what re what refugee uh, charities organizations do you currently work with now? Um, I've been working with quite a huge number of organizations, but predominantly my work engaged with the Justice Refugee Services. Hmm. Um, it's a Catholic um, organization that actually help new arrivals, especially asylum seekers and refugee, so that they can be able to integrate um, in Australia. So Idrissa speaking to you is a person with life experience that I've gone through the thick and things that mm -hmm. has to um, asylum seeker struggles. So um, using me as a case study, uh, part of my work has to do with um, talking to school children, university students, um, community organizers, at least to be able to explain or share my refugee stories mm -hmm. so that those people never have the opportunity to travel out of Australia or I'd never be able to witness, listen and experience the difficulties people seeking asylum and refugees mm. are going through in Australia. So um, these are the organizations that actually create a huge platform for me to be able to meet with stakeholders, at mm. least to share my story with them. Yeah, so um, secondly, again, I've been working again with the um, Refugee Council of Australia. Mm. It's one of, again, like one of the largest organizations that actually work with refugees in Australia. So yearly, they always have like a virtual conference where they host up to like 300 to 400 participants right across the globe, where I really like most of my work has to do talking to those people, let them know some of the good things that actually people seeking asylum have been doing. But these are some of the things actually when it's happened, they all they always like sweat. So I think you're frozen, Andrew. Oh, sorry, your, your internet cut out for a moment there. Sorry. All right. So you can get me now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I said, secondly, um, mm. I've been working again with Refugee Council of Australia. Mm. Um, it's like one of the largest um, refugee organizations in Australia. Yeah. They usually um, host conferences like um, Refugee Alternative Conference. That mm. happens every year. We are in the cater for up to 300 to 400 participants right across the globe. So my work has been with them, like sharing my story to um, those people that are witness or neither have the opportunity to witness those conferences, let them know the achievements and the good things refugee have been doing, not only in Australia, but the world at large. So it we start talking here always like they use me as a case study, yeah. for which um, despite with my overseas degrees that, I, that has not been recognized in Australia, mm. um, within a year and half, I was able to like complete my SAT4 and my diploma for which um, for them as asylum seeker is a laudable venture. So it's part of their case study we are in. I share to people for them to know that these people are asylum seeker and refugee. Mm. If their status has been verified in Australia, they can able to do more to the Australian community. That's yeah. fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm, congratulations on your diploma. That's well done. Um, and the first organization you mentioned, the Jesuit Refugee Service. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, are you a particularly religious man? And do you think that your religion has played a role in your advocacy? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm a religious person, hmm. um, Catholic Christian. And most of my work that has to do with um, advocating for people, I just believe religion, all religion in the world, be you Buddhist, mm -hmm. be you Islam, all religion talk about peace. Yeah. Which are um, categorically clear that you always need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. So my doctrines as a religious person has actually helped me with my work because 
it makes me to see every human being equal mm. in the sight of God. And for me to be considered myself as a ha- happy person, my neighbor needs to be happy too. Yeah. So that of my work always like give me the passion. And despite I'm a Christian, there is nothing like any form of stereotype. Like for yeah. me not to be able to cut across with other asylum seekers mm. that belong to different faith. I walk across with them because we have a common cause of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you're all just asylum seekers first and foremost. You're just trying to help. Exact. That's yeah, fantastic. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you spoke before about how happy it is to show how good refugees can do here, how they can get diplomas. Why do you think it's so important to showcase that? Um, it is very important because like, there are a lot of people, especially, let me take it like from the employment sector. Mm. One thing I always want people to know is that refugee in any country, Australia as a case study, mm. it simply means sustenance. What do I mean by that? Like for employers, it is very difficult for you to employ a refugee in an organization within a year or two for that refugee to quit from that services. It is very difficult. Yeah. Because for them, having a job in Australia as a refugee is like a blessing in disguise for them. Mm. So they always value their career. They always value their employment. So these are people that actually, when they have those opportunities to work for an organization, Mm. it is actually sustainable compared to people like probably, because for them, they don't have access to Centrelink. Mm. (laughs) They don't have access to any form of government support. Yeah. So for them, the job is their life. Mm. And we have seen quite a huge number of times where I mean, like employers, they always gone short because of staff. Yeah. You might be feel like there are certain people they move from one job to another looking for like lucrative salary and all. Yeah. But that is quite different from refugees and people seeking asylum. Mm. So for them, it's like a sustenance. And yeah. secondly, Australia being referred as a diverse nation. There are a lot of things that I believe the average Australians, it is very difficult for them to do those bobby jobs. Hmm. If you actually like move around, like around 11.30, 12 p.m., 1 a.m. in the morning, Hmm. you catch out in the train. Those people you see in the train, majority of them are migrants. Yeah. And what do you think happened? Most of them are working in factories. Those foods are being prepared for the daily worker that works nine to five for them to be able to have access to go to the cafes and got those food. Yeah. And it has been like most of those jobs, they have been done by refugees and people seeking asylum, doing those odd jobs. Yeah. But what does that mean? These are people that actually need to recognize. And again, it comes to the disability service sector, the aged care services. It is very difficult for you to see the indigents or average Australian to engage themselves in night shift doing those jobs. If you go to those jobs, most of the people that you see, they are migrants. And majority of them came here as refugees and people seeking asylum. So this is the questions that like, actually we are talking to the wider Australians, that these people, if given the opportunity to be able to verify their stay in Australia, they can do more, at least to give back to the community. Yeah. Yeah. Does it give you a lot of sense of pride in that the, these are a lot of people doing hard work and they've come very far? Yeah, it, yeah, because like, it just like, as a parent, wake up in the morning, you know that you put food on the table for your kids. Yeah. It's one of the greatest joy. Mm-hmm. So um, we doing those jobs, we know that we are giving back to the Australian community. And like for us, it's a pride. And at the same time, those people that are working in those jobs, yeah. majority of them, they are eligible taxpayer. Mm-hmm. But the, the irony about those taxes that have been paid it is very difficult for them to get it back in return. What do I mean by that? Like now we, we saw during this pandemic when the job keeper was in existence, asylum seekers were not eligible for the job keeper. And where do you think those money came from? It's from taxpayers' money. <laughs> and the majority of them are eligible taxpayers, mm-hmm. you know? And even this COVID-19 disaster payment that is going around, majority of people that have Medicare card. And for you to be able to link your center link to your medi- uh, to your ATU or whatsoever, you need yeah. to have a center link number, and they are not illegible. 
<laughs> you know? So, like, in other words, they are giving back something that is very difficult for them to get in return. Yeah. More that's, than you play at times like this. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. wild. Yeah. It'll, yeah, it'll lock down, especially like this. You figured now would be the time to give back, but... De- definitely, definitely. Mm. Would yeah. you say going off that employment would be a high goal for you in your adv- advocacy? Um, can you go, can you say it again? So uh, would finding employers and finding employment for refugees, would you say that's one of your main goals as an advocate? Yeah, it's one of my main goals because it is very, very difficult for asylum seekers to uh, access job in Australia. Hmm. Because majority of these people, there is a huge discrimination in their visa category. For you to see an employer employed asylum seeker, it is very difficult because they will tell you that your visa can be canceled at any time. Yeah. That is one. And secondly, um, majority of the um, employer, they have this kind of narrative, like probably asylum seekers, they are criminals. They are here to game the system. They don't have any skills. They are uneducated. Hmm. So I don't need to waste my resources to employ them. Yeah, they come into it with that kind of bias, that unfairness. Yeah, it, it's very huge, but they will not put it on your face. And there are times you might have the skills that is required, happen to study here. But there's this funny thing that actually happened. There are times they have this phone interview before the actual interview. Yeah. One of the things that you pick up is like for them to be able to determine your accent. And if your accent is not commensurate to what they are expecting, they will not tell you that they will not give you the job. Yeah. <laughs> but there are other there are other methods that they will employ. So most mm-hmm. of my work has to do with like um try to network with other organizations that mm-hmm. actually build credibility in me. Mm-hmm. For them to know that if we recommend any other asylum seeker, they will still have that credibility that they have for me that this person can deliver. Likewise, Idrissa, you know, so this is the balance because I am already there like a sacred lamp that I've already navigated the way for other asylum seekers. Hmm. So trying to talk to organizations and well-wishers, we always let them know that there are a huge number of asylum seekers out there with skills who are ready to work. Hmm. So when those opportunity actually comes up, we try to like um, transfer those opportunities to those who are, who are unemployed. And as I speak to you, there are people that have been in this country on that bri- on bridging visa for five, six, seven years. Hmm. And since they came to this country, the job that they got, up to now, they are still doing um, those jobs. Up to hmm. now. Because they don't have that access to move from one job to another. It is very difficult for them. So they don't even try it. So whenever you have them in your, in your company or organization, it's hmm. like a blessing for you in disguise. <laughs> because one, it is very difficult for them to absent. Hmm. For them, the thing that's called sick is not part of them because, like, they are not permanent staff. Majority of them are casual. Asylum seekers is very difficult for them to become permanent staff. Yeah. And as a casual, it is only like pay as you go. <laughs> yeah. The day you work, they pay you. Hmm. So for them, they have to pay the bills. Hmm. So every day, whenever they have the opportunity to work, they will go there. There was a time, like a case study, I was talking to a friend just to check on the friend to know how he's doing. And he was like telling me I'm sick. I said, where are you? He said, at work. Having a break now. I said, well, you are sick. Why are you working? He said, bro, what can I do? Uh-huh. So these are some of the crazy things that happen. So, but um, we actually want people to know that giving those people access, it is like a huge um, blessing in disguise. Hmm. Yeah. You, you say that the, your credibility helps give to people that access to employers. Do you ever feel pressure on that do you feel like it's a lot to bear on your shoulders to extend your credibility like that yeah um it's a lot but there is one thing that's always um they make access to me i have um a huge range of um counseling session Mm. that um for every six months voluntarily um i undergo counseling went through counseling at least try to like um share my anxiety with counselors Oh, and there are solutions or profile ways or measures that actually that they will put forward that they will help that actually help me to move on because especially during this pandemic um it is very difficult because even um as i speak to you there are other asylum seekers mm. we don't belong to like 
the same um, country. They are from other African country, yeah. but for them, English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. But what is the difference? When they speak the English that they know, mm -hmm. I can able to comprehend and understand. Yeah. So with the little do I know, I can able to translate what I got from them mm -hmm. to these organizations that actually help. So this is the back and forth that we are having whenever like I engage with them, yeah. especially if they're asking for services. There are times they may like call the services directly and the people in charge also find it difficult yeah. to understand them. So what they will do, they will refer them to me hmm. and they will talk to me and I can able to refer <laughs> actually what they are asking for. So yeah. these are some of the things that I'm going through. But at the same time, I found pleasure in doing that. Hmm. I found pleasure in doing that because there are times people have been asking um, what Australia have done for me. But mm. on the contrary, I actually want to reach to that stage where I can be boastful enough to mm. say to Australia that this is what I have done for Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the direction that I am moving in. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fantastic. I, that's incredible. Uh, earlier, you said before that asylum seekers face a lot of discrimination when trying to get employment, but there's been recent statistics that say around about 80% of Australians support multiculturalism. How, how often do you see that kind of discrimination in not only the employment, but just in general public as well? Um, I think like the, <laughs> the question is like, 80% of Australians support multiculturalism. I think it is abstract. Mm. It is something that is abstract. It is there, but it is abstract. Um, with the project that I am involved in, with the Judith Nelson Institute, mm. it's a very huge platform. I think ever since in the history of Australia that have um, cited this kind of venture, giving people the opportunity from diverse background to yeah. be involved in media conversation. And by and large, Australia media is one of the greatest departments that actually um, multiculturalism is not yeah. in existence. Yeah. Because most of the people you see in the media, these are white folks that actually could not be able to transcend mm. certain messages. The COVID-19 is a case study. We are in, we see most of the cases from the um, Southwestern Sydney. Mm. These are from diverse people. Yeah. Because those people, they have their trusted media for which they gathered information. Hmm. And you cannot wholly and solely depend on seven or nine news to communicate to the wider Australian population. Hmm. So for them, it is very difficult for them to be able to um, accept some of the challenges of COVID-19. Hmm. And again, like in the aspect of diversity in Australia, I stand to be corrected. Like the Minister of Multiculturalism in Australia or Multiculture in Australia, I think um, she's horsey. She's not even multicultural person. So how can he be able to communicate with me? Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. How can he be able to talk to me? How can he be able to know <laughs> the challenges? <laughs> because like people with diverse back or, um, diverse background compared to the average Australian, mm. there is one common thing that we all that is centered because we know that we are here as a migrant. Mm. So what we need to do, we need to abide to the rules and regulations. We need to support the Australian government in whatever things they are trying to achieve. Mm. But like for my community, you cannot be able to talk to them about the safe rules of COVID-19. Mm. They will hear you, but they will not listen to you. What yeah. do I mean by that? Because the information, where it is coming from, the information is coming from someone who they feel that person is not part of them. Mm. So what do you think? We are hoping that Australia being a diverse country, leaders, community organizers from this diverse group should be involved in governance. Mm. And in other words, they will serve as a lesion from their community to that of the Australian government or the New South Wales government. Mm. So like, even there are times when you see the whole um, West, Western Sydney, you see um, helicopter there and there, you see police, you see military, some of them, it sent back reflection because majority of them came from war zone area. Yeah. So for them to see people with military attire parading the city of New South Wales, mm. it, it sent their reflections. Yeah. 
where they came from. Yeah. You know, so these are some of the things because they could not be able to communicate. So to answer that particular question, the diversity in nature in Australia, it is something that is abstract. It is not tangible. It is not tangible. And there are a lot of departments, like even like um, the COVID-19 jar, the first advert that came out, it was very difficult for you to see person with color wearing the advert says, take your job. Mm. All the people in that advert, they are all Aussie. Mm. So that person from diverse background, how can that person be able to listen to you yeah. and able to adhere to some of the rules? Because they felt being like they are not part of the process. Mm. So these are some of the things. It is abstract out there. It is really abstract. Yeah. <laughs> As, as a high profile person in the refugee community, you said you said just then that the government isn't doing enough and needs to be more multicultural itself. Would you yourself ever consider a, a position in governance as an advisor in, in any capacity? De definitely, definitely, definitely. It is something that actually um, I think I'm working towards. And I believe I am still learning, even with the mm. um, JNI that I actually am fortunate to be part of. Like we have our group conversation. My purpose in those conversations is actually, there are times I sit back, see how like people who are born here and raised here, how they communicate. I am still in the learning process. So I'm, by then, I believe by the time it comes, we are in, I am fully equipped that can give me the ability to be able to be part of the governance system. As you rightly mentioned, as an advisor, hmm. probably, because there are certain decisions if you want to take that has to do with multicultural people, yeah. you need to talk to an expert hmm. who is part of that community. So it is something that I look forward to and I am trying my level best to be able to like um, develop myself to that kind of um, KEDA hmm. so that will be part of the process. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to that. That'd be fantastic. I think you could do a lot in that kind of position. I think it'd be very beneficial for the community. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I read a recent media release where you spoke about more early childhood education and care services for refugee communities. Uh, could, you talk, could you talk to me a little bit about that, how you came to advocate specifically for that? Yeah, um, it came about where well, I mean, there was a time there, um, we have a huge number of ladies in our community. They are single parents. Mm. Some of them, um, they have their child with them. And majority, whenever you call them, they are at home with their babies. Mm. What happened? So it came to my notice that most of these women who have kids here, asylum seeker, they don't have access to early childhood education. Yeah. Why? Because they are asylum seeker. So that was the time I started like engaging. There's a program that um, we are working on. We are in what we call the um, early childhood education campaign that we have been working with um, <clears throat> Liverpool, Bankstown, Fairfield, with the um, councillors in those areas and stakeholders to see how best they can able to like um, create a package yeah. for asylum seekers' mother so that their children should have access because. There is this um, saying, we catch them when they are young. Mm. And these kids, generally, when they grow up, Australia will be the place that they will call home, yeah. definitely. And if we fail at this early stage to give them the right education that they require, mm. in a nutshell, what do you think will happen? They will end up becoming hoodlums in the community. Mm. And we don't want that to happen. So we are trying to do this early childhood education for them to be involved as a method of early prevention. Yeah. And this is the only way <clears throat> that they can be involved. By and large, those parents for those um, particular kids, if they have like two or three days where in their kids have access to this facility, mm. they can able to go out there, work for themselves, yeah. and in return can able to be an eleg eligible taxpayer it is very difficult. And for them, even during this pandemic, they stay home with their kids, no learning materials. They don't even know what to do. Mm. So these are some of the things that give me the courage 
to start talking about that, that it is something that we need to look at. But it has been shadowed down over the years. No one talks about it. But because there are single mom with life experience that are going through mm. that particular phase in their life, I just felt like, hey, this is something that we need to address. Yeah. Because if we happen to address them, even for the average Australian kids mm. that they share or they live in the same locality, will be safe. There are people, if you talk to them, they will tell you, I'm too scared to walk at night. When you ask them why, because they just felt like, hey, maybe there are bad people in the community. How do you think all this started? Probably it might have started because there are migrants that have been in Australia before I came to Australia that have been deprived or whose kids have been deprived from this early childhood education. And these are some of the ripple effects that we are trying to combat so that at the end of the day, these kids in this 20s, in this early century, should be able to like have access to such facility. Yeah. So that gives me the courage to start talking about it. And I'm still pushing towards that mm. so that they can be able to achieve that particular dream. I think, yeah, I think it's a great piece of advocacy. It, a lot of studies have shown that early childhood education and education in general can stem mm. a lot of criminal activity in localities. But uh, I'm curious, there's been this idea of early childhood education for asylum seekers has been around for a while and a lot of other groups has tried to advocate it. How do you feel that doing this now is setting you apart? How do you feel like you might succeed now where others have failed? Um, there, there is this thing like we always made mention about. We, we have what we refer to as a carrot and stick approach. There are times when things don't happen the right way, we use the stick approach. When something happens the right way, use the carrot approach. Mm. Now we are getting closer to council election. And there are a huge number of stakeholders who are citizens in this country. They are well-wishers that actually welcome the idea. So these are the people we rally around. Mm. So we serve as a, as a, as a, as a pressure group. We are in, we influence the opinions of those people. For them to know that the community that you are living in, the asylum seekers who actually have act, who actually want access mm. to this facility. So their role in this capacity has to serve as a lesion, talking to their PM, yeah. talking to community leaders, so that those dreams could be able to actualize because. During elections, I believe election is, the, is one of the most important opinion that has been counted. When you go to the ballot box, it's an opinion that has been counted. And those politicians, they need the opinions to the ballot box of those Australians that we are lobbying to. Yeah. So this is the right approach at the right moment because we know that, and there's a paper presentation that we put forward to them, hmm. that if you think you can be able to influence our voting rights to be able to consider you as the government of the people, you need to address some of this issue. So one of the most um, laudable um, achievements about all this process that I think we are going to achieve hmm. is the listening ears that we got from those stakeholders. Times without number, they have created a Zoom meeting. We are in, we discuss, we put our paper presentations to them that mm. these are the things that we are going to do. So one of the things that comes up, they said, hey, we are not going to, we are not, we cannot be able to assure you that we can give you all the quota that you need. Yeah. But at least every year, we can able to provide five or six space for every asylum seeker mm. in three of these LGAs. Yeah. Though it has not been endorsed, but it is something that actually they have put forward as a proposal. Mm. So it simply means we are getting there. Why do you think that's happened? They gave us the listening ideas because the listening here is because <laughs> election is getting closer. Yeah. Definitely. And one mm. way or the other, I might be an asylum seeker. I don't have the voting rights in Australia, mm. but I might be able to influence the decision of other people that are close to me as citizens. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we are looking forward to. Yeah. That's great. 
And I, I know you haven't been in Australia long. I'm pre- you came here in 2018, right? Yeah, 2018, yeah. Do, have you seen in the, in the three short years that there's been more, I guess, appreciation for the difficulties that refugees can go through? Yeah, um, you know, for every good, it has its own bad. For every bad, it has its own good. Mm. But like there are times, the reason why we still continue to advocate, it's just like a never say die moment. Yeah. We'll never shut up. <clears throat> we'll never shut up. We we'll still continue to talk. Yeah. For the fact that Australia are able to create a quota of refugees to be able to welcome in their country, mm. it's a very, it's a very um it's a very big plus on the part of the Australian people and the government. Mm. That is one. <clears throat> but at the same time, we are looking for like these people should not be used like a scapegoat, bringing them to Australia without mm. having the actual facility that they required. Yeah. And Australia, it is not by force or by compare. They are signatory to the conventions of the human rights, mm. which gives every individual the right of seeking asylum. Mm. In every state or community that you think you are safe or your first arrival. So um, encouraging people to stay in Australia is something good. And there are other asylum seekers probably, they are also having certain benefits based on the visa category, as I said. Mm -hmm. Some visa have work rights, some don't have work rights. So those with work rights, it's a plus on their own side and to the government. Mm -hmm. So like, we cannot be able to like blame the government totally that they are not doing good or the people of Australia. Mm -hmm. They are doing good. But what we are trying to say in this context, we actually want the politics in Australia not to center an asylum seeker yeah. and a refugee. Because there has been this phrase for over decades, stop the boat, stop the boat, stop the boat. Mm. And there are generations that have been overheard and those things have been overhyped over the years. And those people are still in those detention. And the money that they used to upkeep those people is a taxpayer's money. Mm. So why can't we allow those people to reintegrate in the community, try to work and give back to the community? So like they are doing good, but we need to still continue to talk because it's like a never say die moment. Mm. The sooner we stop, things will continue to happen that probably will not be in the favor of refugees and people seeking asylum. Adrasa, this has been fantastic. I've learned a lot. And yeah. I, 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 I can easily say I'm very impressed by you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you, have a lot, you have a lot of passion. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, the, the only thing probably I may want to add is that I always want this message to reach to everyone that fortunate to listen or hear what I'm saying. That asylum seekers, they are human beings. Like any other, like any other average Australians, mm. they need to eat good food. Yeah. They need to have a safety net. They need to be part of the economy in Australia. And these are people; they are not criminal. Yeah. They are not here to game the system. So, if I will wrap up in that. The situation we are in, Australia went through the bushfire. Mm. Those people have been involved in that particular bushfire. They became refugee. Yeah. And under the migration settlement program, we call them internally displaced because they move from their natural, their, their, their original inhabitants and look for somewhere safe. Though within the same Australia, where well, they have to move or fled from their original home because of the bushfire yeah. during the floods. We saw how it happened. People move from their home to another place. So those people, in other words, they are refugees, but they are internally displaced. Mm. But the reason being for those asylum seekers that are coming to Australia, they don't have any place that is safe within their own confines to move to. So the only options that they had is to travel probably overseas to places that they think it is safe for them. And we are looking forward for those people to be even have access to facilities. Mm-hmm. It should be quite shocking for people to know that asylum seekers have got their diploma 
who want to go to university, they are being referred to as international students. Hmm. They are referred to as international students, but they have been here for six, five, seven years. Yeah. They are paying taxes. They don't have, they don't have access hmm. to the vet loan or something else that can help them hmm. to continue their study. Why are they international students? So yeah. these are huge questions they are still asking. And they are here working and they are paying taxes. And the taxes that they paid, there are these huge questions they always ask them from taxation. Mm. Are you an Australian resident for tax purposes? Yeah. <laughs> and, if, and if you said yes, that means you are a local. Yeah. <laughs> if you said no, you are international. <laughs> that means you are going to pay more. You know. So like there is this huge thing. So I want people to understand mm. for them to actually know that giving these people opportunity. And it's quite shocking. Majority of asylum seekers are also intermarriages, like <laughs> with Australians and all this funny stuff. They are living happily, <laughs> you mm. know. <laughs> so we actually want that to actualize. These are people with wide dreams. They are people with passion to give to the community. They are ready to work. Mm. They are ready to give what they have learned in, in overseas, at least to transform to the Australian community yeah. so that those things can be mixed together at the end of the day, can become a good end product. Yeah, I think that's my statement. At least I want people to know that. Asylum seekers like me, there was a time um, I was going through the news. They show someone that, um, actually acquired SAT4 mm. and diploma for two years and they put it on the internet you know <laughs> I think like from yeah 11 or so I can't be able to understand actually and they put mm. it on the internet and when I saw it I look at myself here is a man that actually sit down here yeah. and I do my diploma and my SAT4 mm. for one year six months <laughs> you know <laughs> for which yeah for, for which is, it, it is like it is it is very real Hmm. And up to now, we are sitting down without going to university because we are being referred to as international student. No scholarship. Very hard to yeah. get the scholarship. So we are encouraging people at least to help blow the trumpet hmm. so that asylum seekers can be able to give back to the community. That's fantastic. That, that's, that's, that's amazing work, quite frankly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I have just one final quick question. Yeah. Uh, lockdown has made it impossible to get a lot of migrant workers usually come for to work on farms work in fruit picking and that kind of thing do you think that this kind of job could appeal to asylum seekers and refugees Def, def definitely <laughs> <laughs> that question is definitely you know like these these are people like if you if you happen to talk to asylum seeker you know what they will tell you hmm. when you tell them go home you know what they will tell you? I'd rather die here than I go and die where I came from. <laughs> you know, because like most parts of those underdeveloped nations where they came from through persecutions, they mm -hmm. have this thing that they call black death. Mm -hmm. They kill you, they don't know what happens with you. And the news will not say it. No human right. So if people are not coming, asylum seekers, they are ready to do any kind of job that can legalize their stay in Australia. Yeah. Without any fear or favor, they are ready to do that. And these are go-getter. If you are ready to move them interstate, as long as that can validate yeah. for them to be able to live and stay in Australia, mm -hmm. they are ready to do that. And they are willing to do that. Definitely. They are, and they are looking forward to that after this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, they are looking forward to that. That's fantastic. You, yeah. yeah, once again, I can't speak highly enough. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah.